Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Oh, I worship you, Jesus. Amen. Let's give the Lord a hand clap of praise. Amen. Thank you, Jesus. We're going to bring to the pulpit now our morning speaker. We're so privileged to have my pastor here today, Bishop Woodward. Uh, honor him so much. Blesses our fellowship. And he's our next door neighbor. He loves the province of Nova Scotia. And a little secret that maybe some of you don't know, he almost moved here uh, many, many years ago. He's prayed and wept over the streets of this city. Um, a great burden for Nova Scotia. I love him so much. Let's honor him greatly today as he brings us the word of the Lord. Love you, Pastor. Praise the Lord, everybody. What a joy to be in camp meeting this morning. Wasn't that a powerful service we had last night? So grateful for the word of the Lord. So grateful for the man of God, Brother Wayne Huntley, who was in this camp meeting. So grateful for his ministry and his voice and his friendship. And uh, Pastor Justin, your wonderful superintendent, Brother McKenzie, he, uh, he's absolutely right. Thank you. That's wonderful. That's so appropriate. We're grateful for our godly leaders. Brother John Min invited me to come to Halifax in 1993. And I came and I walked the streets of Dartmouth and Halifax and wept over this wonderful part of the world and this great city and this great province. And I had such a burden. I couldn't get clear direction to come, but the burden never left. Sister Min, bless her memory, she was no help at all. She said, now, Brother Woodward, when the Lord comes back, do you want to be stuck in New Brunswick or in the biggest city east of Montreal? That's what she said. He was no help at all. We love her, miss her so much. And um, But when we had the opportunity of sending Pastor Justin and Sister Grace back to Halifax from CCC. I knew then what that burden was about. And I'm so grateful. And to think that he's now leading this district um, and you have given him that responsibility and honor. I'm so grateful for the great plan of God. You know, this is all about one family and one church and one mission. And we get to be part of that, don't we? Isn't that amazing? So grateful. Um, go ahead and be seated this morning. And I have a, a, a wonderful assignment today, one of my favorite subjects from the Word of the Lord. And, and uh, it's something the Lord has laid on my heart for more than one camp meeting this summer. And I'm so grateful uh, to Him for that. It's something very precious to me. Uh, now, let's just mess up the devil and lift up your hands. He's not expecting this one. Lift up your voice loud and high and bold and give the Lord great praise in this room today. I worship you, Jesus. I love you. I thank you for your presence that is in this room. I thank you for your people, your power, your word that is forever settled and established. And I give you praise for that today. I thank you. My subject, a wonderful subject from one of my favorite books in the Bible, the last word from the Gospel of John. It is entirely accurate to say that the Apostle John has the last word about Jesus in the New Testament, and you could give any number of reasons for that. Uh, he's described six times as the disciple whom Jesus loved. He's part of the inner circle of Peter, James, and John. He's closest to Jesus at the Last Supper. He's a first cousin to Jesus. Their mothers, Mary and Salome, were sisters. He's the last one to leave the cross as Jesus is dying. He's the one that Jesus entrusts with the care of his mother Mary at the cross. So you could argue from many of those points that John is the closest of all the disciples to the Lord, and so it's pretty obvious that he would be the final authority or have the last word on the life and the ministry and the death of Jesus. 
But he has the last word for a more important reason. His writing is incredibly powerful because the ministry and the words of his Savior, the Lord Jesus, are burned in his brain. They are seared in his spirit, even decades after the fact. John's memory is so keen. He remembers the very hour he met Jesus at 4 p.m. in the afternoon. He recalls little details about Jesus' ministry. There were six water pots at the wedding in Cana. Who remembers something like that? I don't even remember going to weddings most of the time. He remembers that the Samaritan woman got so excited after talking to Jesus that she left her water pot at the well and ran to tell everybody. He remembers that an anonymous cripple at the pool of Bethesda had been sick for 38 years. Very few people remember details like that. He remembers that the high priest's servant was named Malchus. And he also remembers what the feeding of the 5,000 would have cost, 200 pennyworth. And so he's got an amazing memory. When he begins to write, John writes five books for us. He writes the Gospel of John. He writes the three epistles that bear his name. And he writes, of course, the book of Revelation. The book of Revelation is the last book in the Bible as we have them listed chronologically. But there's a good consensus of scholars. They're not sure exactly what order. We know all five of John's books were written last. We're not sure exactly what order they were written in. And there's at least a group of scholars, a significant group, that feel like the gospel of John may actually have been the very last book in the Bible. But regardless, all of his books are powerful and they all carry a very similar anointing. Here's his epistle, 1 John 1. That which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we have looked upon, and our hands have handled of the word of life. For the life was manifested and we have seen it and we bear witness and we show unto you that eternal life which was with the Father and was manifested unto us. So what John just said is, I'm an eyewitness. I walked with Jesus. I talked with him. I knew him. I heard him speak. I heard his wisdom come from his own lips. I'm an eyewitness. But other disciples were eyewitnesses too. So there has to be more to John having the last word than just that. And there is. You see, John is the surviving elder of the New Testament. His gospel, three epistles, book of Revelation, are literally the final documents written by any of the apostles. And uh, so his, his writing is just an amazing summary. When he puts his pen to parchment, it is 60 years after the day of Pentecost, and it is 30 years since all of the other apostles and gospel writers and epistle writers have died. He's the only one left. His friend Peter, uh, John and Peter had a unique relationship. Um, it's a little competitive at times, it almost looks like. Uh, John makes it a note in his gospel three times in one chapter to say, I beat Peter in a foot race to the garden tomb. Three times in one chapter. Uh, there's a little bit of something there. They're friends. Uh, it's amazing. The first few chapters of the book of Acts, the first 12 chapters, uh, Peter and John are together. John never says a word. Peter does all the talking. It's, it's quite amazing. Uh, you've got a friend like that. Don't point at them right now, especially if you're married to them. Do not point at them. And so they, they're friends, but Peter has been gone for 30 years. And he was crucified, history tells us, head downward. He did not feel worthy to die in the same manner as the Lord Jesus. And Paul has been gone for about the same amount of time. And so there have been no more epistles from Paul or James or Peter. And it's been 30 years. And uh, all of those martyrdoms are now three decades old. And so when John picks up his pen 
It's not just that he's a cousin to Jesus. It's not just that he was close at the Last Supper or in the inner circle. It's not just that. It's that he is the sole surviving elder and he does have the last word in Holy Scripture about the person that we know as the Lord Jesus Christ. John writes in the A.D. 90s when false doctrine is already beginning to rear its ugly head. I would suggest to you that in the early years of the 21st century, we live in a very similar time when people would like to redefine Jesus uh, to suit their own preference. And they make an exceedingly tolerant Jesus every time they do that. He puts up with everything they want to do and he affirms everything that they believe and he's just quite malleable and quite flexible and they make him in their own image instead of the other way around. So I'd like to stand here no comparison intended, but I'd like to stand here in the opening years of the 21st century, and I'd like to stand perhaps in a similar role to John because John wants to make sure that we never lose who Jesus is. This is not just about what Jesus did or what Jesus said or where Jesus went or the miracles that he performed. What's happening here is John wants to tell us if we lose the revelation of who Jesus is, we've lost it all. Because if you don't get who Jesus is, everything else fails, everything else falls. He is the last surviving voice of the original oneness Pentecostals of the truth. If I could be so bold this morning, I thank God for districts like this and we do not believe, nor have we ever believed, nor will we ever believe, that any man-made structure such as the United Pentecostal Church International, that it is somehow the body of Christ. That would be ridiculous. The body of Christ is far too large. However... Those that believe the apostles' doctrine and practice the apostles' doctrine and lifestyle and holiness and experience, they are the church. Not everybody that claims to be a Christian today, that biblically it just doesn't match up. And so we are in a similar place where we need to stand with love, we need to stand with respect. We need to stand as much as we can in friendship with everybody else. If anybody else writes a song about Jesus, preaches a sermon about Jesus, builds a church that they worship Jesus, I'm good with that. However, there's an apostle's doctrine in the word of God that we hold precious and dear. And so we're going to love everybody and we're not going to preach against everybody in a hateful way. But what we are going to do is we're going to stand upon the truth and the revelation that was once delivered to the saints of God. 1 John chapter 5, one of his other epistles uh, he says, for there are three that bear record in heaven, the Father, the Word, and the Holy Ghost. These three are one. They're not three. They are one. There are three that bear witness in earth, the Spirit, the water, and the blood. These three are not one. These three agree in one. These three work together in one purpose because they are the three elements of your new birth experience, the death, the burial, and the resurrection of Jesus, the spirit, the water, and the blood, repentance, baptism, and the infilling of the Holy Ghost. So when John writes those words, he's not emphasizing three. He's emphasizing one. He is not alluding to a trinity, no matter how many people may give some kind of assent to that today. Because at this point, when the elder is writing, there is no such thing as a trinity in Christian doctrine, in Christian belief, or in Christian experience. However, there are trinities. In fact, there are several of them, and you can find them in all of the pagan religions around John. In the Far East, India has a trimurti. That's what they call their trinity, Brahma and Vishnu and Shiva. Israel's ancient slave master, Egypt, has a trinity, Osiris and Horus and Isis. Israel's archenemy, Babylon, has a trinity, Nimrod, Tammuz, 
Semiramis. The Greeks have a trinity, Zeus, Apollo, and Athena. The Romans have a capitoline triad, Jupiter, Juno, and Minerva. And every time Israel backslid, read your Old Testament, they always went to serve a Canaanite trinity, Baal, Molech, and Ashtoreth. But for the people of God, that's not what John is writing about. When he says these three are one, he wants your mind to rock it back to this verse, Deuteronomy 6 and 4. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord. I'm glad I know who Jesus is. I'm so grateful I know who I'm worshiping, who I'm praying to, who walks with me and talks with me. So from his opening sentence, John is on a mission in his gospel. He wants to prove to us that Jesus Christ is exactly who he said he was. Not just a man, not just a teacher, not just a rabbi, not even just a miracle worker. He is what he said he is, the true and only living God in a body of flesh. So, 90% of John's gospel is unique. 90%. He is very selective about the miracles he records. Some are unique only to him. You would not know about the raising of Lazarus from the dead were it not for the gospel of John. And then he does something unique with many of the other miracles. He will twin them with Jesus' teaching. All four gospels record the feeding of the 5,000. Only John records that Jesus whipped around, pointed his finger at the crowd and said, and I am the bread of life that's come down from heaven. Only John does that. There are no parables in John, none whatsoever, but there are many sometimes lengthy conversations because everywhere Jesus is talking to people and revealing his identity and his will. John's writing is the only uh, one that has uh, 25 double amens. Only John records the verily verilies of Jesus, 25 times. It's like amen, amen, or truly, truly, or verily, verily. And when John uses that, what he's doing is he's calling attention to a profound truth that Jesus dropped on his disciples or on the crowds. That only occurs in the gospel of John. It's absolutely amazing. Like when Jesus said this, verily, verily, I say unto you, Greater works than these shall ye do because I go to my Father. Now, we either believe that or we don't. Jesus said about his church, greater works than these shall ye do. I think I have a little inkling of what's going on there because when Jesus limited himself to one body of flesh, one location at a time, he couldn't be in Jerusalem and Jericho at the same moment. But on the day of Pentecost, when he sent back his spirit, first 120 received the spirit of Jesus That's what the Holy Ghost is. Christ in you, the hope of glory, the earnest of your inheritance, power from on high. And 120 received him. And then it was 3,120 before the day was over. All of a sudden, the devil is having a very bad day because now everywhere one of those disciples go, the Holy Ghost goes, the Spirit of Jesus goes, and miracles can happen, signs and wonders can happen because The Holy Ghost is the Spirit of God that dwelt in the body of Jesus Christ. He didn't give you another spirit. He gave you the same spirit. If the spirit that raised Christ from the dead, if it ever dwells in you, gets in you, lives in you, it'll quicken your mortal body by His Spirit that lives in you. Somebody say, that's me. Somebody shout, that's us. So you may not feel very powerful even on your best day, but Jesus who lives in you, he can do anything. My goodness, I'm stuck there. So John is not writing a biography of Jesus. He is writing a theology of Jesus. So there is no Christmas story in John's gospel. There's no baby in a manger, no Bethlehem, no shepherds, no wise men, no star, no angels. 
Because John knows that the birth of Jesus was covered very well by Matthew and by Luke in their Gospels written 30 years earlier. And he also knows something else, that the truth of the incarnation has been believed and preached by the apostolic church even longer than that for about 60 years. So this is very important, and it plays into our subject this morning, that is readers already know what all the other apostles taught and what all the other gospels recorded. He assumes that we know that. It is critically important to position John's gospel as the last word about Jesus. That is, it comes after the other gospels. It comes after all of the epistles. It does not come before them. Now you think, well, that's just playing semantics. No, it's actually very important because there are lots of churches and preachers and speakers today that will reach into the epistles and pull out a verse and say, now that's how we get saved when they never reference back what the early church believed and practiced. So I believe what Paul wrote about, we are saved uh, by grace through faith. I believe that. But Paul also references the spirit that raised Christ from the dead. He also references being buried with him in baptism. He also references uh, godly sorrow that leads to repentance. So Paul is assuming that everybody's got the message that Peter preached on the day of Pentecost. And John is assuming the same thing. I'm assuming that you believe what the apostles preached. You can't safely make that assumption in many churches today. But I'm grateful we can make that assumption in this fellowship. I'm so grateful for that because it's so very important. Let me give you probably the the best example. We love this beautiful verse. It's perhaps the most well-known verse in all of the Bible, John 3.16. It's a beautiful verse. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth on him should not perish but have everlasting life. It's beautiful and it's powerful. But no New Testament preacher ever took a text from that verse because that verse wasn't written until A.D. 90 after all the other preachers that preached in the New Testament had been in the grave for at least 30 years. So no New Testament preacher ever preached from John 3.16. But they turned the world upside down with Acts chapter 2 and verse 38 because John 3.16 is powerful. It's the motivation for the gospel. It's the motivation for God's love toward us. But you've got to do something with that love. It's not just enough to know that God loved the world and he wants you to be saved. You've got to obey his word and that way you can be brought in to his family and that's Acts 2 and 38 and so to put it plainly John is given the last word in the Bible because he most clearly presents Jesus as the last word from God Jesus isn't just like God he's not just part of God he's not just similar to God he doesn't just follow God no Jesus is God God in a body of flesh. That's why he can say without batting an eyelash, I am come in my Father's name. I and my Father are one. He that hath seen me hath seen the Father. Now God has always manifested himself in various ways. But Jesus is the ultimate manifestation of God. Hebrews chapter 1, God, who at sundry times and in divers manners spake in time past unto the fathers by the prophets. That's Old Testament revelation. He hath in these last days spoken unto us by his Son, whom he hath appointed heir of all things, by whom also he made the worlds. Now, if Jesus was there when the worlds were made, that means Jesus is God, because God made the worlds who being the brightness of his glory and the express image of his person, we would say, and the exact carbon copy of God, and upholding all things by the word of his power, when he had by himself 
purged our sins that can only refer to Jesus. He sat down in the place of power on the right hand of the majesty on high. What the writer of Hebrews is trying to say, what John is trying to teach us is Jesus is the ultimate manifestation of God. If you want to know what God thinks, look at Jesus. If you want to know what God's opinion is, look at Jesus. If you want to know what pleases him, what frustrates him, if you want to know what makes him happy, look at Jesus. Revelation 19, one of John's other last words on Jesus. And I saw heaven opened, and behold, a white horse, and he that sat upon him was called Faithful and True, and in righteousness he doth judge and make war. Here's the Jesus that's coming back with his church. Here's the Jesus that the world has never seen. They've got him so dumbed down and so dialed back and so washed up that he doesn't have enough power to heal a headache. But that's not the Jesus that we know. The world has not seen him in his glory yet, but I need to give you a little 411. We have not seen him in his ultimate glory yet either. His eyes were as a flame of fire, and on his head were many crowns, and he had a name written that no man knew but he himself, and he was clothed with a vesture dipped in blood. That's not the blood of Calvary. That's the blood of judgment. This is battle of Armageddon kind of blood. He's clothed with a vesture dipped in blood and his name is called the Word of God. Everything Jesus' Word ever said is going to come to pass including a rapture of his people that's going to happen just any day now and including God coming back and setting this world to right and when he does the world is not going to see a meek little baby in a manger or a beat up Savior hanging on a cross, bleeding out in agony. What they're going to see is the God who formed this universe with the power of his word. God spoke, let there be light. And there was light. And those words are still going today. And in any dark life, in any dark addiction, God can speak, let there be light. And it can turn around in a heartbeat because he is the word of God made flesh. My goodness, I wish you'd take a praise break and just thank God that you know who he is. Hallelujah. I love you, Jesus. I worship you, almighty God. There is no one like you. There is no one like you. So the word is a person, and that person is Jesus. And that's why John's gospel, written 30 years later, starts differently than Matthew, Mark, and Luke. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. One more time, he means for your brain to rock it back to this verse, Genesis 1 and 1. In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. Verse 14, and the Word was made flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory, the glory of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. Jesus is both grace and truth. He is equally God and equally man. He is equally grace and equally truth. He's not going to fudge the details. He's going to tell you the truth about your situation. You are a sinner. You are far from God and you need salvation. But aren't you glad he's not just truth. He's also grace. He's grace and truth. And when nothing else could help, God's love, his mercy, his grace lifted me up out of my sin. Oh my goodness. So 90% of John's gospel is unique. This is Bible class this morning. If you get lost, uh, we'll try to get you back out of the deep weeds. So uh, 90% of his gospel is unique, even in its structure. There's no other gospel like this. There's no other Bible book like this. The first half of John's gospel covers three years of Jesus' ministry. Three years covered in the first half. And that first half includes seven signs that prove Jesus' identity, his divinity. He turns water into wine. 
He heals a nobleman's son. He heals a lame man. He feeds 5,000. Some of these miracles of provision, you say, now what's the big deal about turning water into wine or, or feeding the 5,000? What he's done is he has accelerated a natural process. Uh, you can uh, have grapes ferment and, and the water in them, it'll turn to wine. You can uh, have, have wheat uh, planted in the ground. It grows up. You harvest it. You grind it up. You bake it. it, it Jesus accelerated this. Sometimes miracles are creative and they just come out of nowhere, but there are many other times when God just accelerates something and he does something much faster, much easier, much better, much quicker than we could. He walks on the water. I love that miracle because there's this little old verse buried back in the Psalms, I think, um, that says, God treadeth out the waves of the sea. Only God can walk on water. If Jesus could walk on water, that's a big billboard saying, hey, I'm here. I'm God manifest in flesh. He heals a blind man, and he raises his friend Lazarus from the dead. And John loves sevens. In his gospel, there are these seven signs. There are seven titles of Jesus. There are seven sermons by Jesus. There are seven witnesses to Jesus' deity. And then if you compare all four gospels, you'll find out that there are even seven sayings of Jesus as he hung on the cross. But there is much more than this in John's gospel. Because only in John's gospel does Jesus talk at such length about his identity. John is the only gospel writer who intentionally records what the theologians call the seven I am statements of Jesus. I am the bread of life. I am the light of the world. I am the door of the sheep. I am the good shepherd. I am the resurrection and the life. He that believeth in me, though he were dead, yet shall he live. I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. I am the true vine. It's everywhere in John's gospel. Now, this little part, is invisible in the English Scripture. The English Bible comes to us uh, from, it's a translation of the original Scriptures. The original Scriptures, Hebrew in the Old Testament, a little bit of Aramaic, uh, Greek in the New Testament, and then we get the English Bible. So uh, the King James Version is the classic English version of the Scripture, and in that version, this part is invisible. All we see when Jesus says, I am, is a pronoun, I, and a verb, am, I am. That's not what Jesus is saying. When Jesus says, I am, in the Greek, it's ego, I, me. And a carpenter from Nazareth is reaching back to the greatest moment of revelation in all of Hebrew theology. It's the day that a stuttering shepherd named Moses took off his shoes and knelt in the dirt in front of a bush that was on fire but was not consumed. And God spoke to Moses from that bush and gave Moses his ancient name. I am that I am. That's what Jesus is referencing when he says, I am. He's reaching back to that moment when God said to Moses, I am that I am. Moses, when you go to the children of Israel, you tell them, I am sent me to you. When, when, when you go in before Pharaoh, you said, I am sent me to you. So that's why John uses this all the time. Ego, I me. I am. It's not just a pronoun and a verb. It's a name. Jesus, a carpenter from Nazareth, a man who they say has illegitimate parentage, he is reaching back to that ancient name revealed by God himself. And every time he says it, we miss it in English. Every time he says it, he's saying, I'm the God that appeared to Moses at the burning bush. You may see a guy in sandals and a robe walking around with dusty feet from the trails through all of the Galilee. But what I am is I am almighty God robed in this body of flesh. And that's why there are seven other times 
that Jesus indirectly uses I am or ego I me to refer to himself. I am the one that speaks to you. He said that to an anonymous woman at a well. I am, so be not afraid. He said that to terrified disciples in a storm on the Sea of Galilee. He said, he has a running conversation with the Pharisees in chapter 8. He said, if you believe not that I am, you will die in your sins. This revelation of who Jesus is is really important, brothers and sisters. He says, when you have lifted up the Son of Man, you will know that I am. I love this one. Before Abraham was, I am. (laughs) That's horrible grammar. Jesus, you should pull that into the present or put it in the past. You should say, before Abraham was, I was. Or before Abraham is, I am. You should put your tenses together, Jesus. Unless you're not just speaking grammar, but you're using a name. Before Abraham ever left Ur of the Chaldees, I was there to give him direction to a promised land that he'd never seen. I am that I am. He says um, in chapter 13, when this has come to pass, you will believe that I am. And three times in chapter 18, he says, I have told you that I am. It's everywhere in John's gospel, this holy, ineffable name of God. And Jesus uses it in reference to himself, and it drives them crazy. John spends the last half of his gospel, chapters 12 through 21, summarizing just the last week of Jesus' life. So here's how it works. The first half of John's gospel covers three years. The last half of his gospel covers one week of Jesus' earthly ministry. This is really important to John. He spends five full chapters, 13 to 17, telling us the details of the last conversation between Jesus and his disciples. Early in John's gospel, Jesus would say, Mine hour has not yet come. Mine hour is not yet come. But now Jesus is telling them plainly, the hour is come, and he is a man on a mission. And after eating the Passover meal, you can almost feel the pace of John's narrative pick up. They leave. They go to the Garden of Gethsemane to pray. And Jesus knows that his betrayer, Judas, is already at work. John 18, when Judas shows up, with guards and soldiers in the garden. Jesus, therefore, knowing all things that should come upon him, he went forth to these soldiers, and he said unto them, Whom seek ye? They answered him, Jesus of Nazareth. That's who we're looking for. Jesus looks back at them. Now, if you've got a King James Bible, you'll notice this, that two times in this little passage, the word he is in italics, meaning the translators put it in to make it make sense in English. But it's not exactly what Jesus said. That's why they put it in italics. They did us a favor so we'd know. They said, we're looking for Jesus of Nazareth. And Jesus looked back at them and said a name, I am. And when the Son of God, God robed in flesh, looked at that highly trained battalion of soldiers and said his name, he knocked them down with the power of his name. As soon as he said unto them, I am, they went backward and fell to the ground. If his name was powerful enough for him to just speak it and knock down a battalion of soldiers, imagine what he could do in your sickness, in your trial, in your family situation, in your life. One spirit. Spoken name is all it takes. When he speaks his name, there's authority. I'm glad to tell you we're gathered around his name. We worship his name. We pray in his name. We preach about his name. We sing about his name. So his name is loose all over this tabernacle this morning. And even in a Bible class, you can be healed by the name uh, that is above every other name, the name of Jesus. 
I wish you'd just push pause for a moment. Lift up everything you've got to the Lord because we know who he is, but we also know what he can do. He's done too much for me for me to turn back now. He's done too many good things and answered too many prayers. He's the God above all gods and the King of kings and the Lord of lords. Oh, my. Whew. My goodness. Brother Huntley said it in the car coming over and I was stuck in my brain. He's the great I am. He's the everlasting father. That's who we're worshiping. Amazing. Go ahead, be seated. So Jesus speaks this name everywhere in the Gospel of John. He speaks it at a well, and a sinful woman's life is changed forever, and he speaks it during a storm, and a disciple named Peter is empowered to walk on the waves of the sea, and now he speaks his name in a garden at midnight, and he knocks down an entire battalion of highly trained soldiers. So I get it. I live in 2024 as well. Theologians may have totally missed Denominations may have totally missed. Televangelists may have totally missed. YouTube preachers may have totally missed who Jesus was and what he was saying. But the Pharisees knew exactly what he was saying. So in John 8, when they have that running conversation, by the end of the chapter, they are so angry at him that they take up stones to stone him. Stoning is the penalty for blasphemy. They tell him, we're angry because you, being a man, claim to be God. They didn't think he was claiming to be sent from God. They didn't think he was claiming to be part of a trinity of the Godhead. He was saying, I am almighty God. That's what he says when he says, before Abraham was, I am. And that's what he's saying when he says this. It's curious. John records it. When you have lifted up the Son of Man, something's going to happen when you lift up the Son of Man, and on that day you shall know that I am. Now, this is Bible class, uh, so uh, here we go. We're going to study for a little bit, and if that really bugs you, uh, you can just kind of quietly say under your breath, bless his heart until I finish. But here we go. That name that Jesus is saying is called the Tetragrammaton. Four letters, Y-H-W-H or Y-H-V-H. That's uh, the unpronounceable, ineffable name of God. And it comes from four consonants. Uh, put that up on the screen for me, would you? Yeah. Uh, Hebrew reads from right to left. So we start over here. It's backwards to English or we're backwards to Hebrew. Hebrew came first, so... Uh, it reads from right to left. So those four letters are Yud, He, Vav, He. And uh, they couldn't really pronounce that name. It's unpronounceable. It has no vowels. So when they saw it in Scripture, they would insert vowel sounds, and Yahweh came out of that, or Yahweh. And, and that name was the holy name of God. There's no fully accurate translation into English, all we can really say is the eternal. And the English language changed over the years. Um, it's not that the Bible changes, but can I tell you language changes. And so eventually we end up with a letter J. That came much later. And so we do the same thing with J-H-V-H. We put vowel sounds in there and we come up with the name Jehovah. So whether you say Yahweh or Yahweh or Jehovah or Jesus, it's all the same God. It's all the same authority. It's all the same name. In fact, Jesus actually means Yahweh has become salvation. That's what the name of Jesus means. It's amazing. So the Jews, uh, they, they, they knew this name, but they went into captivity, you remember, because of rebellion. They were in captivity in Babylon for 70 years, and it scared them. When they came back from captivity, uh, sometime around 450 B.C., they were so terrified that they might 
inadvertently, accidentally blaspheme the name of God and incur God's wrath and be gone, be sent into captivity again. They were so terrified, so paranoid, that they actually passed a law to say that nobody in Israel can speak the name of God out loud. Nobody. And, and uh, that was their law. They used a substitute word. Um, they would use the word Adonai. So when the, the, the rabbi, when the priest, when somebody's reading through the scripture and they come to that name, the tetragrammaton, yud He vav He Yahweh, they won't say that name because they've now passed a law in 450 B.C. Nobody dares to speak the name of God out loud. And so they would use the substitute word Adonai, which simply means uh, Lord. And so they would see the word, and the reader reading along in Scripture in the synagogue, when he saw the name of God, he wouldn't say the name of God. He wasn't allowed under penalty of law. So he would say, Adonai, Lord. And the whole congregation would respond, Hashem, the name. They knew what was there in the word. They knew what he was looking at. But nobody dared to say the name of God out loud. How ridiculous it would be for the oneness people of the Old Testament, the Jews, to not be able to speak the name of their God when all around them they've got all kinds of pagans worshiping the names of their gods. And how ridiculous it would be for us when everybody else is espousing all kinds of crazy beliefs and doctrines and religions and lifestyles and conviction today to not exalt the name that is above every other name. If you can talk about your lifestyle, I can talk about my lifestyle. If you can talk about your God, I can talk about my God. If you can talk about your religion, I can talk about my religion. If you can talk about all the benefits of whatever you think, you're getting from whatever you're doing. I can talk about the benefits of loving and serving God. Bless the Lord, oh my soul, and all that is within me. Bless the Lord, oh my soul, and forget not all his benefits. And it's hard not to get stuck on some of these side rabbit trails here, but let me get back. They outlawed the use of the name of God for the common people in 450 B.C. A few decades later, they thought, well, what about those priests and Levites? They work around the holy things of the, the, the temple all day long. Uh, they might accidentally blaspheme the name of God. So they passed another law. Now the common people and the Levites and the priests couldn't say the name of God. They left that only for one person. Only the high priest of Israel could say the name of God, and he could only say it one day a year, when he went behind the veil, only in one place, only on one day, only one man could speak the name of God when he went in behind the veil on the great day of atonement. And that's the way it was for decades. And then in 270 B.C., so this is 300 years before Jesus' earthly ministry, they passed another law. They thought, you know, the high priest, he's just human. And so they passed a law that said not even the high priest of Israel could say the name of God out loud. Simon, the last high priest that we know to ever speak the name of God out loud, he died in 270 B.C. And so by the time Jesus starts walking around the seashores and the streets of Israel, Nobody has heard the name of God revealed to Moses at the burning bush. Nobody has heard that name for 300 years years. And that's why John's gospel is so amazing because all of a sudden you've got this carpenter from Nazareth walking around and he's using the name that nobody's heard with their ears or spoken with their lips for three long centuries. It drives the Pharisees crazy. But let me tell you, Jesus had a right to use God's name because he was almighty God in a body of flesh. He's He's not just using a pronoun and a verb. I am. He's reaching back to the greatest moment of revelation in the Old Testament when God revealed his holy name to Moses at a burning bush. And he's saying, hey, that's me. I'm the one that's walking among you. Oh. And by the way, 
I get it. I read the Old Testament too. And there are all these beautiful names of God. There's Yahweh and there's Jehovah. And, and then you got all the El names, um, El Gibor and El Tzur. And you got all these wonderful names. And, and, and you've got the compound Jehovah names. They're all wonderful. Jehovah Rohi, my shepherd. And Jehovah Jireh, my provider. And uh, Jehovah Nisi, my miracle. And, and, and Jehovah Rapha, my healer. And I am so glad. That I don't have to remember all those things. And I'm so glad you don't because some of you look like you don't know where your car keys are right this moment. We forget stuff. I'm so glad if you're driving out on Highway 108 in the middle of a Nova Scotia winter and your car starts to skid out of control, you don't have to think, now, who, wh- wh- which name? Jehovah Jireh, I need like a tow truck. No, it's not that one. Jehovah Rohi, no, shepherd's not going to help me. Not in a new Nova Scotia winter, that's not going to help. Jehovah Rapha, my healer. No, that'll come later when I get to the hospital in the ambulance. I'm so glad that when I get in trouble, there's only one New Testament compound revealed name of God, and it is the Lord Jesus Christ. And when you speak the name of Jesus, instantly every Old Testament covenant name of God comes to bear on your situation. You just speak the name of Jesus, and you've got a healer. You've got a shepherd. You've got a provider. You've got a deliverer. You've got a miracle worker. It's all in the name of Jesus. That's why we get excited when we sing those old songs. That's why our preachers get excited about the mighty God in Christ. That's why our saints love to worship the name that is above every other name. The only revealed name. The only saving name. The only delivering name. Would you give glory to the name of Jesus before we move on? Hallelujah. I worship you God. I love you Jesus. I worship you, God. I worship you, God. (laughs) My, my, my. Now, there is a Hebrew code in the Bible. I'm not talking about the books that were bestsellers called the Bible Code. They think the Bible prophesies the assassination of JFK and air conditioning. I don't know what. You believe those if you want. But there is a Hebrew code in the Bible It's obscured in English. We don't see it in English uh, because English is a translation from the original language of the Scripture. Um, But if you read in Hebrew, it's it's amazing. Um, Psalm 119, best example. Psalm 119 has 22 sections. And if you open your King James Bible, in front of each of the 22 sections, they each have eight verses. And above each of those sections is a Hebrew letter. That's because... Those verses, each of the eight verses in each of those sections begins with the Hebrew letter over top of that section. So the first eight verses all begin, if you could read it in Hebrew, first eight verses all begin with the first letter of the Hebrew alphabet, Aleph. Second eight verses all begin with the thir- second letter of the Hebrew alphabet, Bet. Third, uh, eight, uh, the third section of eight verses, Gimel, and so on. So, so that's Psalm 119. If you read the book of Lamentations, uh, the same thing. Um, chapter 1, 22 letters. If you could see it in Hebrew, uh, it's the 22 letters of the Hebrew alphabet in order at the beginning of each of those verses. 22 verses, because uh, there's 22 letters in the Hebrew alphabet. 22 verses in Lamentations chapter 1, 22 verses in Lamentations chapter 2, 4, and 5. Lamentations chapter 3, 66 verses. If you could look at the pattern in Hebrew, it's Aleph, Aleph, Aleph.
that deed that nobody heard except from him for 300 years. Sitting there on the chair of men, that's what the seat of Christ is. Sitting on the right hand of power, coming in the clouds of heaven. And the high priest got so angry in that moment, he forgot the law that applied to him. And Caiaphas reached up, and he was so angry at Jesus that he ripped his garments and immediately disqualified himself from the high priesthood of Israel. And at that moment, the authority of the high priest's office lifted off of Caiaphas, the high priest, and it settled down on Jesus the Christ. Jesus, the Son of God. Jesus, God manifest in the flesh. So when he went to the cross, he was not just a murder victim or a martyr. He was a high priest carrying precious, sinless blood as an offering for the heavenly tabernacle. And that's why the writer of Hebrews says, we have a great high priest. He's passed into the heavens. He is Jesus, the Son of God. So for heaven's sake, let us hold fast our profession. Don't you give up or water down the oneness of God. Don't you give up the revelation of who Jesus is. All of your salvation hangs on the fact that when Jesus shed his blood, that wasn't just some prophet's blood. That wasn't just some martyr's blood. God prepared that blood. He calls it, Paul calls it in Acts, the blood of God that purchased this church. That's why his blood can free you from your sins. That's why his blood can break the shackles of any addiction. That's why his blood can pull you out of any trouble. That's why, because it's blood that God prepared in that body. I wish you'd lift up your hands. I'm not just baiting you. I just feel the presence of God in this room this morning. I worship you, God. So Jesus, over three years of his earthly ministry, has enraged the Sanhedrin multiple occasions. He keeps using this ineffable, unutterable, holy, revealed name of God. But this time, he has done it in a court of law. So they want to get rid of him. And under Roman law, they can't execute anybody. And that's all prophecy happening. Uh, John 18, verse 31, then said Pilate unto them, okay, well, if he's blasphemed, then, then you take him and judge him according to your law. And the Jews stop Pilate and say, no, it's not lawful for us to put any man to death. We're under Roman occupation. We're not allowed to put anyone to death. The Romans have to handle capital punishment. Watch this. That the saying of Jesus might be fulfilled, which he spake, who, signifying what death he should die. The penalty for blasphemy under Jewish law is death by stoning. Jesus can't die by stoning because he said, and I, if I be lifted up from the earth, I will draw all men unto me. So Jesus can't be killed by stoning. He has to die by a Roman method of execution. He has to be lifted up on the cross. You can almost feel prophecy just push down the pedal and push, pull into the passing lane. Prophecy is speeding up here. And, and Jesus is going to be crucified. There's no other time in Hebrew history when he would have been crucified for blasphemy, except during the reign of the Romans over the Jews. When the fullness of the time was come. That word, that's prophetic stuff in that word. So Pilate releases the robber Barabbas, and he has Jesus scourged at the whipping post, and he allows his soldiers to mock Jesus with a crown of thorns, and a purple robe, and the bloodthirsty Jewish leaders still, after all of that, whip up the crowd to cry, crucify him, crucify him. Pilate talks with Jesus and finds no fault in him three times he says that. And he tries multiple times to set Jesus free, but all to no avail. 
Matthew's gospel records that Pilate frantically washes his hands and says, I am innocent of the blood of this just person. Pilate's wife even has a dream and sends her husband a note and it's recorded in Matthew's account. Have nothing to do with that just man. I've suffered many things this day in a dream because of him. And so Pilate knows that there's something different about this one called Jesus, but he is uh, manipulated by the Sanhedrin. They're putting political pressure on him. John 19 and 12, Pilate tried to release him, but the Jews cried out saying, if you let this man go, you're not Caesar's friend because whoever makes himself a king is speaking against Caesar. So Pilate is powerless. Pilate can't do anything except maybe just one thing. Maybe there's just one little thing Pilate can do. He can at least recognize what this good man said about himself. Pilate's got a crowd yelling at him, and he still keeps introducing Jesus as the king of the Jews. He knows it irritates him, but he does it anyway. And he has no idea that he's fulfilling prophecy when he brings Jesus out on his balcony and shows him to the crowd early that morning. And when he says, behold the king, at that exact moment across town in the temple, they are preparing the Passover lamb for sacrifice at the same moment that Pilate introduces the lamb who will take away the sin of the world. John 19, 14, it was the preparation of the Passover about the six hour exact times in John. He said, behold your king. They cried out, away with him, away with him, crucify him. Shall I crucify your king? He's baiting them. He's mocking them. And the chief priest said, we have no king but Caesar. What a joke. They didn't love Caesar. Then delivered he him therefore to them to be crucified. And they took Jesus away. And they led him away. And they took Jesus to a place that you know as Golgotha. It's called the place of the skull. It's a place of execution just outside the walls of Jerusalem in that day. And it sits on the highest point of Mount Moriah. Prophecy is coming in like landing lights on a runway. That hillside is the same place where Abraham offered Isaac. It's the same hillside where David made a sacrifice that cost him something and he stopped a plague. It's the same hillside where Solomon built a glorious temple to the Lord. It's the same exact spot where Jeremiah the prophet sat in a cave that we now call Jeremiah's grotto and he lamented over Jerusalem's destruction. And you can feel prophecy converging on that lonely hilltop as Jesus, the substitutionary lamb, the perfect sacrifice, the glory of God, and also the one who wept over Jerusalem. He's taken to that exact spot to be crucified. John 19. And bearing his cross, they went forth to a place called the place of a skull, which is called in the Hebrew, Galgalet, Golgotha. I am so glad for the old rugged cross. And Pontius Pilate, we don't know what he knew or suspected about Jesus, but he's not quite done yet. Whether he understands what he's doing or not is quite beside the point, but his actions that afternoon are absolutely prophetic. John 19. And Pilate wrote a title and put it on the cross. And the writing was, Jesus of Nazareth, the King of the Jews. This title then read many of the Jews, for the place where Jesus was crucified was near to the city, and it was written in three languages, Hebrew and Greek and Latin. Hebrew for the Jews, Greek for the Greeks, Latin for the Romans. Then said the chief priests of the Jews to Pilate, nobody else has a problem with this inscription. Nobody else has a complaint or a suggestion. But the chief priests come and they say to Pilate, write not the king of the Jews. Don't write it that way, Pilate. Change it. Add some words. Write, he said, I am king of the Jews. And Pilate has had it up to here with these chief priests. And he says, what I have written, I have written. In the Greek language, what I have written, I will not change one bit. 
Now, we don't know exactly what Pilate knew about Jesus or what he suspected. All we know is what he did. Written over the head of Jesus in three languages is Jesus of Nazareth, the King of the Jews. Yeshua Hanazari, the Melech Hayehudim. Look at this. From right to left, it's Hebrew. Yeshua Hanazari, the Melech Hayehudim. Jesus of Nazareth, the King of the Jews. The Greeks don't have any problem with that inscription. The Romans don't have any problem with that inscription. Why in the world does the Sanhedrin have a problem with that inscription over the head of Jesus? It's because they knew the Bible code that they had studied for years. They had grown up from being little children, looking at the first letters of words and the first letters of verses to memorize the Scripture. And so when they look at that inscription, all they can see is the pattern of of a condemning acrostic because the first letter of each word spells out yud he vav he God arranged it so that written over the head of Jesus as he hung on the cross was the inutterable ineffable revealed holy name of God Yahweh was written over the head of Jesus as he died that was not a martyr that was not just a rabbi that was not just a teacher that was God robed in a body of flesh shedding his blood for our sins no wonder there's power in the blood we sang it this morning it reaches to the highest mountain and it flows to the lowest valley why because God provided that blood that blood can heal you that blood can deliver you. That blood can free you because God put that blood in that body that was offered on that cross. Oh my goodness. <laughs> but it's even more beautiful than that somehow. It just, this Bible, it just keeps unfolding layer after layer after layer. When we were in COVID, don't even think about it. Don't go there. When we were in COVID, we were in the youth chapel, and in the youth chapel, we actually took a series and studied through Psalm 119, and because of those patterns that are in it, we actually studied through, imagine, teachers are crazy, uh, studied through some of the Hebrew alphabet. Every letter in the Hebrew alphabet has a numerical value, but it also has a picture associated with that letter. Uh, if you think about Egyptian hieroglyphics, it's a similar kind of language. Or if you think about Chinese uh, characters, it's a similar kind of language. That every letter in the Hebrew alphabet, it has a picture associated with it. So the, the little letter Yud down here, um, it's associated with uh, a symbol, the hand. Uh, the next letter that kind of looks like a door frame, uh, that's Hey. Um, they, they would say that looks like a window. And because you look through windows, uh, the letter hey came to mean behold. And then that long skinny letter, the third one over from the right, uh, that's a vav. And vav, the symbol associated with it, the letter actually looks like the symbol. It's associated with a nail. <laughs> so this is amazing. Because hidden in the name of God, from the moment he revealed it to Moses at the burning bush centuries before, was this message. Next picture. Behold the hand. Behold the nail. That was always in the name of God that they worshipped in the synagogue, that they wrote the Psalms to, that David prayed to, that Moses honored. That It, be, it was always encoded in the name of God. Behold the hand. Behold the nail. Calvary wasn't plan B brothers and sisters. He was the lamb slain from the foundation of the world. So when Jesus died on that day, all around the cross, creation couldn't help but speak. The sun darkened and the earth shook and the rocks split and the graves opened and the temple veil was ripped apart. All around the cross, creation couldn't help but speak. But over the cross, prophecy couldn't help but speak. Behold the hand, behold the nail. Yud he vav he, Yahweh is shedding his blood for your sin. So let's come to a close this morning. You've been so kind and attentive and worshipful, and I appreciate it. Even after their enemy is dead, the chief priests are having 
panic attacks. It's ironic in the Gospels, but it seems like the enemies of Jesus got what he was saying far more clearly than the disciples of Jesus. The disciples of Jesus are totally clueless. They go into hiding. The chief priests go to Pilate and they say, we're afraid that guy's coming out of the tomb. So, Pilate, we need a favor. Um, We want you to get some guards and secure that tomb because that deceiver said that if, if, if we destroyed that temple, they knew all the time what he was talking about. They made out like they thought he was talking about tearing down the temple. They didn't believe that for a second. They knew Jesus was talking about his body. He said, that deceiver said he'd rise in three days. So we need you to put a guard around it. Can you imagine going out to a cemetery and you see a bunch of guards around a grave? What are you guys doing? Well, we're making sure this guy doesn't come out. That's what they were, that was their assignment. Pilate said, that's ridiculous. And here's what he said, I love this. Go your way, make it as sure as you can. I don't know what Pilate believed or knew about Jesus, but it's like he's mocking them. I think if that man said he's coming out of the grave, chances are he might come out of the grave. So you go do your thing. And that brings us to this moment. John chapter 20, verse 11. Mary, on the morning that we now call Easter Sunday, she doesn't know it. To her, it's just the third day after the death of her master. But Mary stood without at the sepulcher weeping, and as she wept, she stooped down, and she looked into the sepulcher. And she saw two angels in white sitting, the one at the head, and the other at the feet where the body of Jesus had lain. I've been at that tomb multiple times. Uh, the British own it now, the British Bible Society, and they, uh, the Garden Tomb uh, Society, and they, they do a wonderful job preserving that. And I've been there and looked in that tomb. I really do believe that is the place uh, for a number of reasons. But when she looks in, I've looked in that door. You, straight in is the mourner's chamber. And then if you look to the right, that's where Jesus' body would have laid. There are two stone beds. The archaeologists tell us one was never used. The other was hurriedly used. It was beautifully carved into the rock, except Jesus must have been tall because they had hollowed out a little place. It would be disgraceful for you to lay a body there in death and its knees be bent. So hurriedly they had hollowed out a little place so his legs could lay flat. And that's the place where Jesus was laid, I believe. But whether that's the exact spot or not, here's what I know happened. That first Easter morning, Mary looked in that tomb, and she looked at that flat slab expecting to see Jesus' body wrapped in grave clothes. And instead, she sees two angels in white sitting, one at the head and one at the feet where the body of Jesus had lain. On that first Easter Sunday morning, she saw the most familiar silhouette in all of Hebrew theology. There's only one other place where you find two angels sitting, facing each other over a flat surface. It's called the mercy seat on the Ark of the Covenant. When she looked in that tomb that Easter Sunday morning, she saw a visualization of the Ark of the Covenant. Do you remember... What dwelt between those angels on the Ark of the Covenant? It was the Shekinah glory of Almighty God. Why could Jesus raise himself from the dead? It's because in that body dwelt the Shekinah glory of the God who created the universe. In that body dwelt the Shekinah glory of the God who walked with Abraham and talked to Moses and delivered Daniel out of the lion's den and was with those three Hebrew boys in the burning fiery furnace. The Shekinah glory of God dwelt in that body. That's why he could raise himself from the dead. And the Bible tells us if the spirit that raised Christ from the dead, if it ever gets in you, it'll quicken your mortal body. Why can the power of God change you? Because it's the same spirit that raised Christ from the dead. That's the spirit that's in you today. That's the spirit that empowers his church today. Oh my. I thank you, God. 
Oh, I'm, I'm sorry. I, I'm, I'm a few minutes over time. I'm, I'm sorry. Uh, what is it the young people say? Sorry, not sorry? There we go. Okay, sit down. Three more paragraphs. Here we go. John's gospel culminates. It's a unique gospel. There's no other book like it in the Bible. John's gospel culminates with the inspired revelation of a man we know as Doubting Thomas in chapter 20. Chapter 21 is like a postscript. The gospel actually comes to a conclusion in chapter 20, and then John adds a postscript in chapter 21. Every linguist and every scholar will tell you that. So so this man, uh, Doubting Thomas, he's one of the disciples, and he holds the esteemed nickname Doubting Thomas, um, and he's held that for 2,000 years because he missed one church service. That's All of you YouTube apostolics, you need to take uh, note of that. There, pastors, that's my meddling for your benefit in this camp meeting. Thomas, he wasn't at, I don't know what he was doing, hiding somewhere. He wasn't at the first meeting when Jesus showed up in his glory. And the disciples were so thrilled because their master is alive. And they rush to Thomas and they say, Thomas, he's living He's alive. We've seen him. And Thomas looks back at them and says, you people are delusional because we all saw him die and we all saw the agony and we all saw the nails and the spear and the blood and we all saw them pry his lifeless body off that agonizing cross and hurriedly wrap it in grave clothes and take it to a tomb and discard it there. We all saw it. There's no way, guys. I can't believe. The only way I could believe is if Jesus showed up to me personally and I was able to put my finger in the nail prints in his hand and thrust my hand into that gaping wound in his side. Only then could I believe. And let me tell you, our Jesus is so kind, so gracious, so merciful that there was another meeting and Thomas was there and Jesus showed up and he said, Thomas, put your finger in the nail prints in my hands and put your hand in the spear print in my side and don't be faithless Thomas but you can believe you don't have to be doubting Thomas you can be believing Thomas and at that moment John brings his gospel to a thunderous conclusion because Thomas in that moment gets the revelation that John writes about 60 years later. Thomas grabs two words that had never been used together before in Scripture and he puts the word Kyrios, master or sir, a title of respect, with the word theos, which means almighty God or supreme deity. And Thomas, when he sees mortal wounds in the body of a living man, anybody would have bled out in seconds from those gaping wounds. But this man is talking to him, and he's still got the nail prints and the spear print in his side, and Thomas gets it. He says, you're not just my master, my Kyrios, but you're my my Theos. You are my Lord and my God. And that's the revelation that John is wanting to anchor the apostolic church to for all of time. Because if you don't get who Jesus is, divine healing doesn't operate. And if you don't get who Jesus is, the deliverance of his blood doesn't operate. And if you don't get who Jesus is, your praise is misdirected to some person of some fictitious trinity. But when you know who Jesus is, you You can lift up his name and you're praising every attribute of God in both testaments and all down through the ages and the pages of time. And I'm thankful to worship Jesus with a group of people that know who he is today. And Jesus actually says that. Thomas, because you have seen me, you have believed. But blessed are they that have not seen and yet have believed. Thomas, one day there will be a group of people in Nova Scotia and they will never have walked with me 
And they will never have talked face to face with me like you had the privilege of doing but they will get the same revelation that you just got and they will be a witness to everybody around them. My Lord and my God, he's not just a stranger to me because when I looked past the veil, it was easy to see he's my Lord and he's my God. Um, music, Brother Cole or Brother Josiah, somebody come back and give these precious people some hope. Be seated just for one more second. I got like two more scriptures and I'm done. If, if, it's, if it's too long, if it's too tedious, if it's too detailed, just say it's Bible class. He's a teacher. Bless his heart. You'll be okay. So, Thomas, someday there's going to be a group of people who never walked with me in the flesh, but they will walk with me in the spirit. And though they have never seen me with their physical eyes like you just did, they will receive the very same revelation that you just received. They will know. They will be the, they will be the last day's oneness apostolics. They will know that I am God manifest in the flesh. They will know that I am the mighty God in Christ. They will know that I am the last word from God. They will know that I am the supreme manifestation of deity. They will know that I am that I am. John chapter 20 verse 30. Many other signs truly did Jesus in the presence of his disciples, which are not written in this book. John said, I didn't write down everything. But these are written that you might believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God. You get the revelation. And when you get the revelation, believing you might have life through His, what? Through His name. There's only one name that we worship. There's only one name that we preach. There's only one name that we love. Skip ahead to the very closing verses of John at the end of his postscript in 21. And he says this. This is the disciple which testifieth of these things and wrote these things and we know that his testimony is true. I was an eyewitness. You've come too late to tell me that Jesus wasn't who he said he was. And there are also many other things which Jesus did. The which, if they should be written every one, John said, I suppose that even the world itself could not contain the books that should be written. Amen. So here's the point. End of Bible class. John's gospel is very effective, isn't it? But it's also very selective. Here's what I mean. All of the events, all of the conversations, and all of the miracles John records occupy only 25 days of Jesus' ministry in the first half of his gospel and one week of Jesus' life in the last half of his gospel. So, out of the 1,280 days of Jesus' earthly ministry, John only told us about 32 days out of 1,280 days. None of Jesus' parables recorded by John, only a handful of miracles. So you could say, well, that's maybe what he's referring to. No, I think it's more than that. Remember, John has the last word on Jesus. He is writing 60 years after the day of Pentecost. So here's what John means when he says that. Jesus didn't just do miracles for three and a half years. Jesus has been doing miracles in the apostolic church through Peter and John and Paul and James. And Jesus has been doing miracles for 60 years. I'm just sitting down with my pen and putting it on this parchment that if we'd written down everything he's done in his church through his people over the last six decades, the world itself wouldn't fill the books. 
John, like Paul, like James, like Peter, is also dead and gone. He's been gone for 2,000 years. But for 2,000 years, Jesus has still been doing miracles, still been changing lives. And in the province of Nova Scotia, this very day, this very week, Jesus is still alive and well by the power of his spirit. And you hold the pen that's going to write the last chapter of the apostolic church for the province of Nova Scotia and we need to make that document a really good one we need to make that a document of revival and harvest and soul winning and miracles and signs and wonders because if Jesus could do all of that in 32 days imagine what he can do that's a month imagine what Jesus can do in a month through all the people that are in this room that are filled with the same spirit that raised Christ from the dead jump to your feet let your hands extend toward the ceiling and would you lift your voice high and loud and bold with excitement with worship and just begin to worship the only name the only name the only name worth praising the only name worth living for the only name worth praying to it's the name of Jesus le rodo la basiara batera bossa re bolo da bare batara bossa batera boko rabasa I'd like you to leave where you're standing this is very important cuz bible class is not just a lecture about history this is a living word. This is a revealed word. Would you leave where you're standing as quickly as you can and come to the front, come as close as you can and come as close to the center as you can. Let's gather in here. Let's fill in this part as quickly as we can. When you get here, before we pray together, lift up your hands and give glory to God. Lift up your voice like a trumpet and give glory to God. Lift up his praise in the sanctuary and give glory to God. Don't just stand there silent this is a powerful revelation that you've got you know who Jesus is and you know that he's here right this moment and if Jesus could do all of that in 32 days imagine what he can do through all these people in this month in the province of Nova Scotia really important here Reach over to somebody on either side if you can. Grab their hand with yours and lift every hand that we can lift. Lift every hand that we can lift. And lift your voices together like a mighty choir and give glory to the only begotten Son, to the only Lamb of God, to the only God, the only wise God, the only true God, the ever-living, never-dying God. He's here right now in this room. You can be healed right now because you're in the presence of Jesus. You can be delivered right now because you're in the presence of Jesus. You can receive the Holy Ghost right now because you're in the presence of Jesus. You can be delivered from a trial right now because you're in the presence of Jesus.